All right. Shalom. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Again, welcome to the late show. And it's starting to become really light right now. So let's get right into this. This is one of those pieces of research where I've kind of put off talking about it for several months, delayed uh, for a few reasons. One is I don't know if people are going to like it or hate it. I really don't know. And I have to warn you guys that tonight I'm I'm just I'm, I'm not telling you that this is the way it is. I'm just reading the Bible and going, hmm, this is a possibility. These are things I'm seeing in here, and I think they're worth talking about, whether they're true or not. So this is – some of the stuff is going to be my opinion tonight, and other things I'm going to talk about is me kind of just reminiscing and kind of thinking through things and going, this is a possibility, all right? So uh, as the title suggests, back to the Bible – you guys like my little Back to the Future? I, I worked hard on trying to match the Back to the Future logo. I worked a long time on that. So I, don't, I just don't want that going to notice. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Time Travel and Scripture by yours truly, Noel Joshua Hadley. This is I, I put this together yesterday, and it was like 50 pages of notes. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I don't think I'm going to get through this all tonight. We'll see how much I can get through. This might have to be a two-parter. Time travel isn't a foreign concept in these parts, as I will direct you to my Wizard of Trump paper. I gave that about a year ago, that presentation, uh, talking about the Mandela effect and other things like that, back to the future. Oddly enough, it didn't start out that way. The first draft was bare bones commentary on the Mandela effect as it pertained to the terrorist man in Back to the Future, which just so happened to be a time travel movie as plots are concerned. I published, published the original one, uh, long ago, long, long ago in the spring months of 2017. I, I was talking about the Mandela effect way back when. If you must know, three years later in the spring of 2020, smack dab in the trenches of the, uh, the pandemic, I reworked the paper to involve Donald Trump as a grand wizard of the um, ceremony, I guess you could call it, the ceremony that was going on, but also because an obvious Biff Tannen connection needed made. Fast forward another three years to the spring of 2023. That's when I finally gave in and theorized that the Back to the Tr Future movies were, in fact, real time travel movies. What I mean is that the Twin Towers, the, the Twin Tower demolition event happened on 9 11, 2001, just as we remember it. And then the Back to the Future movies were made nearly two decades earlier in the 80s. Yes, that is what I'm suggesting. Nearly 30 years of predictive programming may in the very least point to that possibility. And I, I talked about how it, it's so overwhelming. It, the, the predictive programming of 9-11 started back in the late 70s. Mid-70s is where I'm seeing the earliest. And... And it starts ramping up and ramping up all through the 80s into the 90s. And my suggestion is that because it's not just that they were saying, OK, 30, 40 years from now, there's going to be this big, you know, the ceremony they're going to pull off. It was so precise decades before as to really make me question reality at this point, especially with all the stuff on the Mandela effect. And the idea was, is that, well, let me read the next paragraph. See, I'm not going to make through this tonight. CERN's part in this, there's another link right there, is another component which mustn't be forgotten in this discussion. Here is a worthy question. Is it remotely possible that CERN was capable of sending information back to a specific moment in our past so as to fast forward their own technological advances or maybe other reasons as well beyond that? I am suggesting the 1970s, though even the late 19th century is a possibility. I don't really know. Now, I... I don't believe, I'm not stating that someone is climbing into a DeLorean or a phone booth and traveling back in time. I'm not suggesting that. But I'm asking, is it possible that they could uh, uh, electronically somehow send information back to the past to help kind of advance things and move things forward and, and work kind of cyclically like that in a bit of a time loop? The alternative Trump is president plotline in Back to the Future 2, which I saw in theaters as an eight-year-old, implies that my childhood memories exist within the established time loop, meaning Trump became president first, and then as an eight-year-old, I watched Back to the Future 2, in which it predicted that there would be like this, you know, alternate, askew timeline where Donald Trump is president. 
Understanding why our controllers would be interested in something like that is the easy peasy pie slice of this investigation for manipulation of the masses, duh. But then to take it one step further, Satan was cast out of heaven, indicating that he was thrust into time. He is now bound by the very time he is imprisoned in. So, you know, Allah Hayyam, or you say God, is outside of time. And he works outside of time. He works in time from outside of time. But now Satan, he cannot exist outside of time. He is bound in time itself. And that couldn't be made any more clear than with his thousand years in the abyss, as per Revelation 20. A segment of time is given by which he is shackled to it. Unlike the Rolling Stones song, time is not on his side. And so seeing as how we are currently inhabiting the short season of Revelation 20, I'm thinking it's a total possibility that our spiritual controllers would be attempting to manipulate the material realm into time loops so as to extend their limited run. Now, I'm not going to talk about that tonight. It's something I would like to in the future. It's almost like the plot line to uh, The Matrix 3 where they just keep rebooting it. And uh, it was also the plot line to the fourth one as well. And they, so they keep doing it in cycles over and over and over again. It's like the idea that like what if the, the 1970s keep getting rebooted and we just keep going through this? Uh, is that at all possible? Is that or at least is that what Satan is attempting to do? Because we see that he's telling us his plans in the movies and other pieces of literature and, and the media. Uh, is this what he desires in the very least to do to extend his time on the earth? And of course, that's not the topic of today's exercise, though. No, today I want to focus upon actual incidents within Scripture, uh, three in total, each of which are hundreds of years removed, though all are directly overlaid upon the other. The defining difference between these three examples and whatever our controllers are cooking up in the kitchen is that Allah Hayyam, that would be uh, God, our, our, our Heavenly Father, lives outside of time. He is in no way obligated to the laws of this physical realm, though our controllers are. They are our, our controllers as well as Satan. They have to work with the, the, the laws of this, uh, this construct. <clears throat> Supposing the life of an individual or even his story as a whole were one long movie, then I suppose it is safe to say that Allah Hayyam is free to intercede with, with and work upon whatever frames of the film and in whatever order he so chooses. I will let you predestination versus free will representatives fret over those fine points and duke it out. I remember when I was like uh, in college, I was probably about 19 or 20, and I was sitting in my church college group, and I, I actually brought up this question. I just said, hey, guys, like, what if – because I, I had been thinking about this for days. I was like, guys, what if like history, like human – like time itself is like movie reels? You know, it's just you could you could unroll it all the way back to creation and all the way to the end. And and they're like, OK, I'm following. And I said, well, what if um, just like in any movie that's being edited before you have the, the end result that that uh, I would say God back then, that God is like going in and working at different frames at different points. And I, I kid you not, they started freaking out. They're like they got really upset. And I, I <laughs> I kind of had to leave. Uh, story of my life. Uh, thank you guys for not kicking me out for saying that now. The transfiguration of Yahusha HaMashiach is the event which has my gaze. Yep, for some of you, the cogwheels are already turning. Sparks are flying. You already know where this is going. Though some of you may need a little more, bit more processing before the aha moment arrives. So let's hop right to it. So this comes from uh, Bezor, Matthew, that would be Matthew chapter 17, 1 through 8. And after six days, Yahusha takes Kepha, Yaakov, and Yochanan, his brother, and brings them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moshe and Eliyahu talking with him. Then answered Kepha and said unto Yahusha, Adonai, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here three tabernacles, one, one for thee and one for Moshe and one for Eliyahu. And of course, that would be Elijah. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, 
This is my beloved Yaquid, or son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear, hear ye him. And when the Talmudim heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Yehusha came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Yehusha only. Of course, that would be Matthew 17, 1 through 8. A problem which has emerged from the scene, more like a difficult to maneuver observation, is the fact that Moshe and Eliyahu were already dead. They would have resided at present in Sheol. That is furthermore a problem since the Torah instructs in no uncertain terms that the conjuring of ruachoth, of, uh, of spirits, or you could say dead souls, is forbidden, as per Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. You can look that up for yourself. Compare the scene with Shaul and the witch of Endor conjuring Samuel or Shem, Shemuel from Sheol in 1 Samuel 28 and see where that got him and didn't end well. The next solution offered to us is that Eliyahu, of course that's Elijah, and Moshe were simply visions, unconscious visions rather than real living, breathing beings. Wait, are we talking about holograms? We have those. Uh-oh, Project Blue Beam comes to mind. There must be something else going on. To say Yahusha was having a lively conversation with cartoons is not so dissimilar to the modalist argument which has Mashiach praying to himself in the garden rather than an actual father in heaven. Apparently, Yahusha wasn't into two-way communications with real conscious beings, LOL, there has to be something else going on. Now, it was a vision, uh, but a vision is way you will be talking about that tonight. A vision is way you kind of you penetrate the spiritual realm and you go you can go outside of time. You could see the heavenly realm uh, as it somehow is connected with time, but not within time itself. Also worth noting is that only Yahusha is transfigured before them. Moshe and Eliyahu simply appear. I checked. Marcus 9, 2 through 8 describes the same event though we learn little to nothing of their appearance. In Luke 9, 30-31, it, it does, however, specifically mention that the two prophets of yore appeared in a glorified state. So there's that. Getting back to Yahushua's transfiguration, though. Matthew Yahu explicitly describes his face as one which did shine as the sun. His clothing became a garment of light. Though imagine having to stand face-to-face -face with the sun. You couldn't. Nobody could. You'd go blind. Your face would melt right off. You'd probably evaporate into nothing within minutes or seconds or a, a split second, which is why nobody can look upon Yahuwah and live unless they are in a glorified state, that is. And obviously Moshe and Eliyahu were not glorified at that moment in time as both had made Sheol their home, awaiting the resurrection from the dead. Now they were glorified in the vision, but you see what I'm saying? They were in Sheol. At the time, they were dead. My suggestion to you, the reader, or in this case, the listener, is that Yahushua's transfiguration is an episode involving time travel, if that hasn't been made abundantly clear quite yet. Moshe and Eliyahu were coming face to face with Mashiach in his present, but from centuries long past. What if I told you those two separate instances? When they visited Mashiach in the future, that is, were recorded for us by the writers of Scripture. I'm guessing the implications will be too much for many and most to deal with, and I'm including those of you who are able to accept the time travel scenario. Mm -hmm. There are implications. All right. So I'm saying if even if you can accept the time travel scenario, there's going to be additional implications that I think some people cannot get past. And I'm simply not ready to kiss and tell quite yet what those implications are. You will have to keep reading. But which of the two stories to start with, Moshe or Eliyahu? I honestly sat here for several minutes attempting to decide. Sometimes a man has to put his indecision aside and act for once in his life. Well, Eliyahu it is then. I'm thinking nearly the entire chapter will need laying out for purposes of context. So um, this is... Um, um, and Akav told Isabel, this would be Jezebel, this would be Ahab and Jezebel, all that Eliyahu, Elijah, had done. 
And withal, how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. You guys remember the Mount Carmel incident? Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Eliahu saying, So let the gods do to me, or the Elhim, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So she's saying, by tomorrow this time you're dead. I'm going to kill you. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Be'er Sheba, which belongs to Yehuda, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Yahuwah, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of Yahuwah came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Shorev, the Mount of Allahayam. That He goes to Mount Sinai. And that's incredible. He went, he ate, and then he went 40 days and 40 nights without, uh, without eating. And drinking, I take it. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of Yahuwah came to him. And he said unto him, What are you doing here, Eliyahu? And he said, I have been very jealous for Yahuwah, Alahayam, Sevaoth, for the children of Yashuel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy, thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before Yahuwah. And behold, Yahuwah passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before Yahuwah. But Yahuwah was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but Yahuwah was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but Yahuwah was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And it was so, when Eliyahu heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice into him and said, What are you doing here, Eliyahu? And he said, I have been very jealous for Yahuwah Alahayam Sevaoth, because the children of Yahshua have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And Yahuwah said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you come, anoint Chazael to be king over Aram, that would be Syria, and Yahu the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Yasharel, and Elisha the son of Shapat of Avil, uh, Mekolah, shall you anoint to be prophet in thy room. And shall come to pass that he that escapes the sword of Chazael shall Yahu slay, and him that escapes from the sword of Yahu shall. Uh, Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Yashorel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha the son of Shapat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he went with the 12th, and Eliyahu passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. That comes from 1 Kings 19, 1 through 19. Well, there it is. You just read it. The instance when Eliyahu stood in the presence of Yahuwah and conversed with him. And now you know what Yahushua HaMashiach was speaking with Eliyahu about during the transfiguration, that is. During his earthly ministry, Yahushua had business to attend to, past and present. And it appears as though he wanted to ensure Yahu was anointed king in the place of Akav and Isabel. And that, um, that Elisha was furthermore instituted as a prophet under him. Supposing these two conversations did overlap, then I should point out that the part where Yahuwah assures Eliyahu concerning the number of those in Yashua who hadn't bowed down to Baal. They were on reserve. I find that particularly touching since three of his Talmudim, whom he had personally chosen, were just feet away watching the scene unfold. And you could see here, here's Moshe. 
Problems which may arise regard our never having been informed of Eliyahu's transformation to a glorified state, or that he even saw uh, the Allah Hayam of Yashro face to face. So there's that. But then there's a couple of observations which I will ask you to jot down in your investigator's notebook. Eliyahu's encounter with Yahuwah occurred on uh, the Mount of Allah Hayam and only after he fasted for 40 days, because the same can be said of Moshe. Both he and Eliyahu stood on the same mountain. Speaking of which, here is the other account. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Write thou these words, for after the tenure of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Yashorel. And he was there with Yahuwah 40 days and 40 nights. So that we see the repeated theme. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. So Elijah and Moses do the same thing. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moshe came down from Mount Sinai with the two ta tables of testimony in Moshe's hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moshe knew not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Yashua saw Moshe, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. That comes from Exodus chapter 34. A moment or so earlier, I had stated that Eliyahu didn't speak to Yahuwah in a glorified state. But now we read how Moshe had no clue regarding his own transfiguration. It all came down to Aaron and the crowd which surrounded him to deliver the ghastly news. They were so terrified of his appearance that he required a paper bag, or was it a veil? Uh, contrarily, Eliyahu had no such person to, te uh, to terrify that we know of. He arrived alone. He left alone. Moshe hadn't the faintest clue, so why should Eliyahu? Now that the missing case of Eliyahu's transfiguration is settled, we can know what order of business Yahushua HaMashiach had with Moshe while transfigured on the mount. He was delivering the Torah. Oops. Well, that's only slightly awkward. Was that something which is allowed to be said? I'll probably be, <laughs> I'll probably be run out of Sunday school all over again. I already gave you the the uh, the I give you incidents of that all the time. The very son of Allah Hayam, whom Christians claim did away with the Torah, went on a weekend retreat with his buddy so as to secure his father's commands in writing via the lawgiver one divine mountain portal to another. Yet one more accomplishment to chalk up to his earthly ministry. It kind of makes you wonder about passages such as this one. This comes from Bezorah, Yochanan, chapter 5. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moshe, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moshe, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? The reason as to why a rejection of Yahushua HaMashiach is a rejection of Yahuwah is because they're the same person. Another way of saying it is that Yahuwah, the al Hayam of Yasharel, is the son of Allah Hayam. There's, the, there's that implication I was getting at earlier. Not the first time I've stated it either, but there's always a first for someone out there. When Yahushua told the temple controllers that they didn't believe Moshe because they didn't believe his words, it's because Yahushua was Yahuwah who dictated those very words to Moshe. Could it then be said that a rejection of Yahuwah, the Allah Hayam of the Old Testament, is a rejection of Yahushua? While you sit around pondering that, here is one more scripture memory verse which comes to mind. Bezorah Yochanan, again, uh, chapter 1. No man has seen Allah Hayam at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Seems pretty straightforward if you ask me. The Allah Hayam whom Moshe and Eliyahu met with and spoke to was Yahuwah the son of Allah Hayam, all along, a.k.a. Yehusha HaMashiach, which brings us back to the point of this discussion. Did he use time travel to do it? I'm not through yet. There's more. Let's see, I'm only on page uh, 10 out of 50, so actually there's a lot more. I intended to get to the other details on the last go-around, but ran out of time, no 
pun intended. So glad it didn't, so glad it didn't collect dust in my to-do stack for three years, as is often the case. From what I can tell, there are three other notable examples of time travel in canonical scripture. They involve Yochanan and uh, Zachari uh, Zachariah, or Zachar Yahu. Uh, now, uh, I'll get to the third later, but the first two here. That would be John and Zechariah in the English. When it came to Moshe, Eliyahu, and Mashiach, the implication was that Yahusha was Yahuwah, whom they spoke with in, varying, in three different times coming together at the Transfiguration. Today's discussion, or this segment, however, may get even freakier. No, this isn't a freak out, far from it. But uh, but then personal experience goes to show, depending upon who reads this, some may not be able to tell the uh, difference between getting freakier and a freak out. Well, this comes from Revelation 11, 1 through 2, and it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of Elohim and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out. And measure it not, for it is given into the other nations, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Well, jumping right into it, Yochanan is told to measure the temple. The context is Revelation, which will immediately trigger someone into um, insinuating that I'm somehow suggesting he's time traveling to the future Zionist state post-1948, which I'm not. A most painstakingly obvious and straightforward reading of the book has Revelation describing the destruction of Yerushalayim under Titus and Vespasian in 70 AD, telling us that it was written before that event. As the rest of you hopefully know by now, I wrote all about the fulfillment of Revelation in the glorious appearing of Yehusha HaMashiach. The same book covers why the Temple Mount is also a hoax. It's actually Fort Antonia. Uh, it was the temple was never built on the Temple Mount, which is what Yochanan would apparently be measuring if he were transported to our own century. And he's not. To to see what I'm getting at, we will have to power read through my next time travel example because I'm saying that to measure the temple, Yochanan was uh, time traveling. I lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Hmm. Then said I, whither do you go? And he, the man with the measuring line in his hand, said unto me to measure Yerushalayim, to see what the breadth thereof is and what the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, the man with the measuring line, and said unto him, run, speak to this young man, saying, Yerushalayim shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, says Yahuwah, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. This comes from Zachar Yahu or Zechariah 2, 1 through 5. And so there's a pretty picture there of the man with the uh, measuring, measuring line. Who is this man with the measuring rod which Zachar Yahu sees? We are not told. Zachar Yahu doesn't seem to have a clue who the man is, nor does the man in relation with the prophet. The suggestion I'm making is that Yochanan very potentially is that man. He has been told to measure the temple in Yerushalayim, though he remains in prison at Patmos. The only achievable method, method is by way of vision, which is what uh, Zechariah happens to have as well, a vision. They meet each other in one. Is it a perfect fit? Well, I highlighted the part that some of you may have a problem with. Yochanan is told to measure the temple in Yerushalayim, whereas Zachariah, who sees the man measuring the city itself. Hmm. Well, hold that thought. Because look at what happens next. The mystery man nabs the curiosity of the angel who is guiding Zachariah through the vision, so much so that he stops everything to approach him as if something is out of sorts. But then another angel plops himself down into the vision he just comes out of nowhere, just plops himself down so as to apprehend the first angel. I should probably mention that measuring Yerushalayim or the temple in the Bible is a sign of judgment. The angel who has inserted himself into the vision instructs the guiding angel to tell the mystery man all about the Yerushalayim, which is still to come. That would be, he says, uh, he says it will be inhabited without walls, with any number of cities and fields of cattle making up its precinct. 
The reason being that Yahuwah will be unto her a wall of fire round about and a glory in her midst, and really an all-consuming fire. From this stunning visual, we can deduce that the sinners will have little choice but to remain in the outer darkness. That's yet another reference to New Yerushalayim and the hidden, uh, the hidden wilderness, by the way. The thing is, Yochanan is told to measure the temple in Revelation 11. We see that part already. He doesn't have a vision of New Yerushalayim and the Blessed Land until Revelation 21, and wherein we read the following. Hope you guys are following my train of thought. I can stop and explain this if you guys need me to. And I, Yochanan, saw the holy city, renewed Yerushalayim, coming down from Elohim out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her man. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will tabernacle with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. And Elohim shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, 2-4. I'm wondering now if Yochanan's vision of new Yerushalayim can be said to result from the angel instructing Zachariah, who's angel, to sock it to him, for lack of a better phrase. So basically, Yochanan is told to go measure the temple. He's on the island of Patmos. The only reason he, the only way he can do that is through the vision. Well, he happens to enter the vision, which Zachariah has hundreds of years earlier, uh, regarding a man going to measure. And the angel who is uh, with, with Zachariah, who he starts walking up to him. Another angel enters this vision. It's almost like a, like, I'm thinking of like some sort of like, uh, like, like loading, uh, uh, almost like a matrix type of thing, right? Like kind of like a program, you know, where you could like enter into this room. And the angel comes in to tell the other angel, okay, go tell this man who's measuring about He's here to measure, to to measure, you know, to judge the destruction of Jerusalem. But tell him that there is a new Jerusalem coming that's going to have no walls. It's going to be, it, you can't even measure it. It's going to be so, you know, just massive because there's going to be cities with cattle in between. It's all going to be one precinct. And so then Yochanan tells of his vision of new Jerusalem. See how that works? So it's almost like this angel approaches him in uh, Zachariah's vision. And he tells him, and then he writes it down in Revelation. Usually I reserve any mention of a voice from heaven to be the Ruach HaKadosh, which still may be the case. But then if we lay Revelation 21 and Zechariah 2 over each other, one can easily see how the voice derives from Zechariah vision guide, the angel. He is simply following orders and describing for Yochanan what is to come. I have never personally been asked, though I would imagine, Measuring Yerushalayim for judgment purposes is not a pleasant task, not even for a prophet. And what Yochanan needed was a pick-me-up via broader peripheral vision. The Yerushalayim to be destroyed was not the heavenly one and wasn't the one to come down and inhabit the, the hidden wilderness. Come to think of it, the implication regarding Yochanan and Zachariah's cohabitating vision isn't so dissimilar from what was already put forth earlier. Allah Hayam is outside of time. I wouldn't know the first thing about exiting the construct of time, though if I did, I imagine plucking out multiple individuals from any number of mile markers in his story and placing them into the same the same vision, uh, the same room, really, the same program, if you want to put it in those terms, shouldn't be a problem. But then consider this. Have you ever had a vision? Well, I have. I'll speak for myself in stating I have had a multitude of them. Th those aren't bragging rights, right? And I, I don't, I don't talk about them often. I, I don't base ministries off of you know sp spoken words or uh, visions or things like that. I'd rather my research be the, the the foundation. Well, think about your own visions that you've had. Did anyone visit you and speak with you? And who was that person? Do you know who that person was? How do we know our heavenly visions do not share space with the visions of others from thousands of years ago or even from some other future unwritten date? It, it's almost like a, like a shared dream. Like imagine you, you have a dream at night and, and there's like a hundred other people having that same dream. They're like in that same dream and you'll never know. Look, Allah Hayam is either outside of time or he isn't. I would say it's 
uh, I would say it's rocket science, but we all know the moon landing as well as the entire space narrative is a hoax. You guys still hanging with me? Now, since we're dealing with implications, quote unquote, the vision given to Ezekiel, that would be, uh, if I can pronounce it, I always struggle his name, Yekas uh, L. I'll just say that. But since I haven't gotten down, I'll say Ezekiel. Regarding the future temple complex presents to us another, oh, how do I say this? timeline complexity more like another timeline entirely now this is the portion here where i'm telling you guys like I, i'm just speculating okay i'm just kind of looking at something and saying what if all right i'm not telling you this is the way it is so just hear me out on this far as my knowledge goes ezekiel's temple was never it was never constructed at least not in the reality that i currently inhabit certainly not on our side of the known realm maybe it was in the hidden wilderness. I, I really don't know. Of course, you're familiar with the drill by this point in our relationship. Jesuit written history books aren't exactly a reliable source of information. Now, in the past, I might have suggested the blessed realm is the place where Ezekiel's temple was built during the millennial kingdom of Mashiach. I still stand by that. It very likely was, or maybe the case. It's just that we mustn't forget Ezekiel's temple was never a sure thing. Whoops, it just now occurred to me that you may be completely lost if you haven't skimmed through two other obscure papers of mine. I'll, I'll be touching on these tonight, so um, don't worry if you haven't. The first is The Millennial Kingdom Already Happened, Philip K. Dick and the First Mandela Effect. Now, give that one a read, or you can listen to the video. Any questions? I ask because I am in no way promoting Christ consciousness, all right? Nor am I leading anyone in that direction. So please... You know, don't sweat it. Don't think that I am. I am never going down the Christ conscious path. I'm not going to tell you that you have to ascend through these different dimensions. Like that's just, I, I'm still waiting for all the Christ consciousness people to like disappear and like, you know, just ab be absorbed into other dimensions or whatever. Philip K. Dick is free to his opinion, whereas I keep my own. Okay. His notion, however, that the millennial kingdom has happened or that it is currently happening in another dimension far removed from our own is fascinating beyond words. These are the sort of discussions I wish I could have with real people around the campfire. Instead, I am pressed to figure out why Taylor Swift is uh, married to football and what team her boyfriend plays for. I just looked up his name on the internet, Travis Kilsey. He apparently plays for the Kansas City Chiefs. Chances are I'll forget both of those facts within the hour, which actually is true. I did forget it because I, I'm still not going to remember. Like, just bring up football. I'm like, I'm zoned out. The second is the 7,000-year the 7, timeline deception in light of the Mandela effect, the other paper or video. Uh, well, actually, I've never turned that in video. I'll be I'll reading that hopefully tonight if I have time. I published the, the later with little or no fanfare. Though, might I suggest giving the Lion in the Land, the Mandela Effect, a try while you're at it? Lots of people are bemoaning the Mandela Effect. In fact, more and more normies are waking up to the construct changes by the day, but very few seem to be appreciating what is truly going on with the Mandela Effect. There is so much discussion on what is false and what is true, and very little regarding the distinct possibility that most, if not all, of these changes stem from a true reality. Maybe not our former true reality, but a true reality. The lion and the lamb is the best example that I can give. We now live in a world where the wolf and the lamb rule the day. Though for me, it has always been a lion. I, I distinctly remember the lion will lay down with the lamb. Pick a wolf or a lion, I'm, I'm over it. As I have shown, they are both theologically sound positions, each sharing a rich textual history. And so... There, there's some there's some texts out there where if you insert line into wolf, it doesn't work. Uh, that they are specifically ancient texts that I've shown that is referring to the Benjamin Wolf prophecy. And so I'm also wondering if the two biblical timelines, as presented in the Hebrew Masoretic and the Greek LXX, were equally separate worlds that collided together. Now, some of you are just like, I, I'm sorry, I'm not even going there. I, I'm not even going to uh, dance you know, with that thought. I'm not even going to go on that waltz uh, or entertain that thought, but I am going to be talking about that tonight. What if, uh, this is where the Mandela effect really hits the fan, how much you're willing to accept that, 
that our, our very fabric of reality, our very timeline has been altered with. Or in this case, that there is a blending of two realities and we're seeing the residue of both. And this is why people are arguing over it. Which is the true one? What if they're both correct? According to the Masoretic, Mashiach arrived 4,000 years after Adam. Uh, whereas it was 5,500 in the LXX. And a lot of you know that's where I'm getting my timeline from when I say that the Millennial Kingdom started in the year 500 AD, the year 6,000. So these are the things I think about late at night. I really do. I lay there and I think about these two things. We might as well toss Ezekiel's temple into the discussion then. If you're uh, uninterested, then oh well. I'll be content sitting here by the fire late at night having the conversation by myself. Um, that's, I guess, what I'm doing right now. I'm just talking to myself on camera. And hopefully someone will be interested in what I have to uh, say. So here's what it uh, actually says. You, son of Adam, show the house to the house of Yasharel. That would be the temple. Show the temple to the house of, of Yasharel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, their, their transgressions of the Torah, their sins, and let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, Show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof and the goings out thereof and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof and all the forms thereof and all the Torah thereof and write it in their sight that they may guard the whole form therefore and all the ordinances thereof and do them. This is the Torah of the house upon the top of the mountain. The whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the Torah of the house. As I started out saying, the vision was of a future event, but not a certain one. Ezekiel's task was to present the temple blueprints as personally designed by Yahuwah and offer it to the children of Yasharel with the explicit condition that the Torah be upheld. If the sons of Yasharel were convicted, and therefore, shame to their transgressions. And there's the key, guys, because everyone's like, oh, you can't keep the Torah. But you, can be, you can be convicted and ashamed of your transgressions. That's actually keeping the Torah. Repenting of your transgressions, saying, I transgress the Torah and I repent of that. That's the Torah, guys. That's doing it. So for all the people out there saying you can't do it, apparently maybe they're projecting onto it because they're unwilling to be ashamed of their own transgressions themselves. That's usually what I think they're really saying. Uh, ashamed of their transgressions against the Torah, then the temple qualifications were met. That's it. They don't have to be all messiahs. They don't have to walk perfectly. They have to be ashamed of their sin. The covenant members of his generation weren't ashamed, though. That's just the thing. It appears as though most chose to stay behind in Babylon, in the diaspora, preferring it that way. And the few who did return settled on a temple complex far less grand. So what we eventually know is Herod's temple was far less grand than what Ezekiel's temple would have been. Mashiach would have personally, you know, or I should say Yahuwah would have personally designed, uh, built this for them. So again, it didn't happen or did it? Before I attempt to address that question, I think it's best that I show you another conditional promise in the Bible. And Yahuwah, and, excuse me, and Yahuwah shall scatter you among the nations. That's the promise. That will happen. And ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whether Yahuwah shall lead you. And there ye shall serve Elohim, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But if from thence you shall seek Yahuwah Elohika, you shall find him. If, there's a condition, if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And, of course, the only way you can do that is to be repentant of your transgressions, to be ashamed of the things you have done to transgress the, the, the instructions of righteous living, the law of heaven. Fact of the matter is, Yahuwah says he would scatter Yasharel amongst the nations. That part reads like a promise. It was a certainty. No questions asked. I therefore take something like that to mean every conceivable outcome within the same way even given a, plura a plurality of parallel worlds to choose from. In the end, the wide road of existence becomes the norm. Whether living in the land or out of the land, mankind's covenant relationship with Yahuwah trends in rebellion against his Torah. 
they forsake the blessing in favor of the curse. The conditional part then follows. It says, if the person, so just to backtrack or just to show you that I'm saying that like, imagine if there were <clears throat> millions of potential outcomes. It appears like in every single outcome. I mean, this is how grim the story of the Bible is in terms of our sin. In every single outcome, Yashua would choose the curse and they would be dispersed. So there's not one single outcome. It's that's a promise. It's not a it's not a condition. It's like a promise. You will be expelled from the land. The conditional part then follows. It says, if the person now living in his diaspora, and of course, diaspora means the dispersion amongst the nations, chooses to seek Yahuwah with all of his heart and soul, he will find him. That much is a promise. Sure, the passage addresses the individual who leaves the wide road of existence for the narrow, but I take it to imply a larger body, body as well, because the context is you, not necessarily you, the reader, or you, the listener, but you, as in you, Yasharel. The promise isn't that Yasharel would return, nor is the timing of the return given. It simply says, if, if they seek him out in their diaspora, then they shall find him. Are you following? Perhaps not. This may require further explanation. Now, supposing we can agree that given a plurality of worlds to choose from, each of which is a parallel reality created from our decisions, this is just Mandela Effect 101, every single possible outcome would end with the diaspora of Yasharel. That doesn't necessarily mean that they would all transpire at the same point on the timetable. Some the, the diaspora may happen sooner or later, depending on different you know variable circumstances. Well, the same goes for the seeking part. Given the conditions, some worlds, some alternate realities, dimensions, whatever you want to call it, may need more time to return to Yahuwah than others, and some theoretically will never choose him again at all. But you weren't expect. Bet you weren't expecting that. The multiverse theory haters, <laughs> there's a lot of multiverse theory haters now, particularly in Hollywood, are rolling their eyes right about now. Be careful that they don't get stuck that way. Also, the Calvinists are preparing to hawk a loogie my way as if I had a choice in rejecting their predestination doctrine to begin with. And so, and I, and by the way, I don't necessarily um, uh, reject predestination. I think that there, it's a mystery between free will and pre predestination. I know that there is a type of predestination. I don't have the answers on that, but I also fully believe in free will. So I, I don't know how it, it works out. I really don't. <clears throat> I guess that's above my pay grade. And so getting back to my original point, the temple of Ezekiel, was Ezekiel given a vision of an actual reality or a fictional one? We're talking about a world which literally transpired for some, but not for others, all based upon their choices, naturally. Perhaps the better question is why Yahuwah would go about creating the blueprints for a building project which never had a chance of materializing to begin with. All I'm doing is speculating at this point. I really wouldn't know, as this is the only reality that I inhabit, one which uh, the temple was never built. <clears throat> I think it's worth considering, though. Just because Ezekiel's temple isn't a reality for us doesn't mean it never happened. Okay, so let's get into some Mandela effect. I'm doing pretty good on time. And I'm going to start getting into some, on, on some kind of different theories on what I think is going on. I explain it best, I think, in The Lion and the Lamb, where uh, the other one that I talked about, I think I'll be addressing again tonight, is uh, the idea of Samson. And I always grew up with the story that Delilah cuts Samson's hair. But if you read the Bible now, uh, Delilah does not cut Samson's hair. She sends in the barber. She sends in a Philistine to do it for her. And one of the things I theorized on this is that it, it's not that necessarily, you know, people are like, oh, the Bible is changing. It's like, well, OK, yeah, I mean, yeah, it is. I mean, if we have these like dimensions that are uh, colliding together. Right. And so you have one kind of reality overtaking another. Imagine imagine all these variations. Right. And uh, these parallel stories. And in one Delilah goes through with it and she actually cuts Samson's hair. And that's the story I grew up with. But in another, uh, she, you know, she, the, the, her intimidation, whatever got the better of her, she kind of chickened out. She couldn't do it. And she, she called someone else in to do it for her. 
in the end, it ended the same way. Samson's hair was still cut. He lost his strength, and he still took out all the Philistines after his eyes were um, uh, plucked or burnt out. And um, and so at the end of the day, you still have this, this narrative that is being told, but you have – think of all the variations in your own life, right? Like all the little choices you have, the hundreds of little choices. And so we might be seeing things like that happening. And, and I again, in review, the lion and the lamb uh, – like the wolf and the lamb is not evil, guys. It's it's a wolf and a lamb dwelling together. And just what if, you know, in these two different realities, uh, Isaiah here, uh, Yesh, uh, Yeshiahu says it was a wolf and a lamb. Good theology to that. In the reality I grew up in, it was lying in the lamb. But, you know, they kind of came together and one overtook the other. All right. So with that in mind, let's look at Michelangelo's creation of Adam. And I say is how it should be. All right. The way... Uh, yeah, the way it is now is the way it should be, according to enlightenment, enlightenment thinking. Amongst all the confusion, the Sistine Chapel is finally starting to make sense. I began tackling the Manila effect a great many years ago now. I actually, I, I discovered the Manila effect back in the spring of 2016, right you know, right when like the flat earth was really trending and taking off. And uh, I didn't start writing about the Manila effect till the spring of 2017. I was closeted flat earthist and, um, and Mandela effector. Anyways, ruminating over the implications of it all, and only recently have I felt as though I am able to grasp some of the deeper implications at play and really appreciate them. As another reminder, nothing is cookie cutter about the ME, nothing at all. And so that being said, there are rumors afloat that the changes are flipping back to their original form. And that's one of the, the theories that a lot of Mandela factors have, and I think that there, there's a truth to that as well, at least some of them anyways. The Sistine Chapel seems as good a contender as any if you ask my opinion about it. Uh, so the idea is, is that what if there was, uh, in, in some of respects, what if the Mandela effect was going on way longer than any of us give credit for? I mean, some of us will say 2014, 2015, 2008, 2000, 19, 1990s. I don't know. But what if there was just this consciousness to the changes now, but these changes have been going just hundreds of years and that, you know, generations ago that the history books were being flipped back and forth and so on and so forth. So the Sistine Chapel, okay. Uh, oh, the creation of Adam most certainly looked different at one time. No doubt. I'm not denying that. It's all wrong now, according to how I remember it. Adam's hand should be reaching up to the creator and vice versa. So uh, so my, my the way I remember the creation of Adam is that the creator's finger is coming down and Adam's is going up. But now it's like it goes up and it's kind of limp down. And then the creators is below Adam, all right? Uh, so Adam's hand should be reaching up to the creator and vice versa for uh, Yahuwah Elohim. He should be reaching down. Uh, Elohim should be reaching down. The way Michelangelo's painting works out now is that Adam's is slightly above God and his fingers look, well, flimsy for a lack of a better word. It's all wrong in that Elohim should be reaching down to man as my memory serves me. But as I was trying to tell you, I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised if the Mandela effect is getting it right. Allow me to explain. But first, here is the residue you're always asking about. So, I mean, this is the way I and so many of you remember this, that in, in all these recreations, it's always the creator coming down to touch man. Man is reaching up. It's not man reaching down to uh, to the creator. Plenty of residue is available on this one, though I don't intend to show many of them to you. It's not that I'm being cocky or anything. The, the reason why you're perfectly capable of looking them up for yourself this time around is because I have bigger fish to fry. And anyways, here are two examples. I think uh, that's Swedish over here on the left, which I'm not presently capable of reading. And the auto repair photo looks to be a, a television production, also unfamiliar to me. It's impressive, though. Every detail looks just about right. They have improvised with a wrench, but the context is still spot on as the elder mechanic is reaching down to lend a helping hand. Correction, the poster is Polish. I plug the words uh, Ludzkosk Papara Wiona into an online translator, and this is what the internet spit back at me. Humanity corrected. So it's transhumanist then and sinister as hell. At least they're being honest about the motives. 
On the skin deep surface, a human hand is reaching down to spark the techno wizardry upon another human hand. So looking at that again right there, this is the, the Polish poster. I thought it was Swedish, but it's Polish. Um, but then you should know it's a story as old as time itself. They're attempting to create the God within. Thoughts such as that one brings me right back around to Michelangelo, but I am not quite ready to go there yet either. Here is yet another uh, interesting slice of Americana residue for your consideration. Boom, there it is right there. I mean, everybody from the 80s remembers this poster. The E.T. soundtrack is a mirrored image of the Sistine Chapel. Amazing how apparently none of these artists thought to look at the Sistine Chapel and uh, get the details right. Which is perhaps not a coincidence considering the movie's Aleister Crowley Moonchild influence. The place of God this time around is E.T., the fairy-like wood goblin from the ethereal realm who doubles as an earth caretaker slash botanist and pineal gland illuminator of a select child who is simultaneously learning to love and let his father go. That was a lot there, but that was pretty much the plot of the movie. That was a mouthful. <laughs> I said that was a mouthful, I know. Prove me wrong though. Write your own movie review. I dare you. Come at me, bro. And my daughter is up. She's banging on the door outside. I think my wife's going to go get her. Anyways, you have now been given a handful of examples. All three are obvious references to the creation of Adam, as many to most of us rightly remember it. But again, I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised if the Sistine Chapel's current look is exactly as the Renaissance painter originally intended it. I have reasons for feeling this way. The key phrase in all of this is renaissance. It's a French word that means rebirth. They may, that may not make a lot of contextual sense unless you first take a crash course in medieval arts. I presented dozens of examples in my End of the Millennial Kingdom paper detailing the differences between medieval and renaissance art, and they're staggering. Without repeating the entire lecture, let's see if I can sum it up. Medieval art was intended to teach. Now, both of these here is enlightenment art. There is no uh, medieval art uh, shown here. Medieval art was intended to teach morality lessons using scripture as its peripheral vision, all of which directed the soul towards a heavenly pilgrimage. Contrarily, the so it was it was teaching you to look within and to look higher to seek uh, Allah Hayam, to live a virtuous life, to seek out the kingdom. Contrarily, the two images before you are prime examples of Renaissance thinking, and as you can tell, they glorified in the individual. This is Art 101 stuff, by the way. I mean, I'm not making this up. It's just, you take an art class, you'll learn this. There's even a word for it, humanism. Humanism can be defined as an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to the human individual rather than the divine or supernatural. That's just a nice way of saying the Renaissance controllers sought to usurp Elohim by igniting the divine spark within, and they used art to do it. I think that just about sums it up. And so take another careful glance at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and tell me who the divine one is from a Renaissance point of view. The ME critics are claiming Adam used to be God's inferior, whereas now their standing is uh, questionable all thanks to a swap of perception in their hands and arms. They would be correct in their assessment, which is why I'm saying Michelangelo's quote-unquote masterpiece is more Renaissance than it was in our memory. Okay, so I'm saying that the, the new version, thanks to the Mandela effect, seems to make more uh, contextual uh, sense with the Renaissance, in my opinion. I could be fully wrong about that. So is it possible that we're actually seeing it flip back to the way it originally was? All right. We Three Kings never happened or did it. PK is an acronym for pastor's kid, and that is what I was. When the church doors open, I was there, planting my bum in the theater chair. Resumes such as that one pretty much qualifies me to make the following claim. Some of you are already rolling your eyes, expecting me, expecting me to say something with the raving eyes of a madman like, the Bible always used to say three wise men, and now it doesn't. Well, if that's what you were thinking, then you're wrong. I wasn't going to make any such claim. Let me finish a sentence without interruptions for once. Stop making up arguments 
and then firing back with your rebuttals. What I was going to say is the worship leader never could seem to instruct us to turn to We Three Kings in the hymnal. It was one page number or another without an annoyed congregant turning around and telling me, I remember this all through the 80s, it never says there were three of them in the Bible. It was three gifts which they gave. Why mustn't we assume, or why must we assume, it was only one type of gift per person? They may have been 12 or 20 in number, an entire caravan of them for all we know. I am paraphrasing, of course, or am I exaggerating? Conveying frustration is more like it. I would then watch the said person turn around and grudgingly sing along year after year after year. And so I would sit there in my chair, a young Noel Joshua Hadley, listening to the words of We Three Kings, wondering what else we assume the Bible says, but which it doesn't, like eating unclean animals or swapping the Sabbath to Sunday and doing away with the holy days, replacing it with Easter and Christmas. Before we get too far into this, here is what the Bible currently has to say regarding the nativity gift bearers. Reading from the King Jimmy. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 2. From the KJV. As you can clearly see, there are not three kings arriving from the east. Not even three wise men. They are simply magi, number unknown. That is precisely how it has always read for me in my reality. Nothing has changed. Why am I thinking to include this in a book about the Mandela effect then? Because it is a curious exercise. Also, there are people out there claiming that it was always a party of three in their recollection. Now, I could sit here and call it a false memory on their part. I could even blame the We Three Kings song for their brain malfunction, but why do that? The ME does not victimize everyone evenly, and uh, if you're still thinking otherwise, then I am sad to say you have learned little to nothing about the nature of the world we live in. If the Mandela Effect has taught me anything, it's that we are to sit and listen to other people's personal experiences and not bulldoze them, them over as if our informed reality is the end all. All right, now let's see what this is right here. The Persians under uh, Kusra II invaded Palestine and conquered nearby Jerusalem in 614, but they did not destroy the structure. According to legend, their commander, Shah, Shah uh, Baraz, was moved by the depiction above the church entrance of the three magi wearing the garb of Persian Zoroastrian priest. So he ordered that the building be spared. Basilica of the Nativity is a place which I have visited multiple times. And they will tell you that the invading Persians refrained from destroying the church in 614 because of what they saw contained within. They saw depictions of, and I quote, three magi wearing the garbs of Zoroastrian priest. It appears as though, as though that legend is told to nearly every visitor because even Wiki is saying the same thing. And that's what I would hear when I went there. Whether this story is true or not is anybody's best guess. I wouldn't know as I wasn't there. The number three, though, how far back does the tradition go if it's not to be found in the Bible? We see here, We Three Kings, original title, Three Kings of Orient, also known as We Three Kings of Orient are, or The Quest of the Magi, is a Christmas carol that was written by John Henry, Henry Hopkins Jr. in 1857. At the time of composing the carol, Hopkins served as the rector of Christ Episcopal Church in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and he wrote the carol for a Christmas pageant in New York City. It was the first widely popular Christmas carol written in America. Isn't that interesting? The Christmas carols uh, that were popular in America were being written in the 1800s. We Three Kings was written by John Henry Hopkins Jr. for a New York City Christmas pageant in 1857. But as I've already shown you with the Basilica of the Nativity story, he wasn't the individual responsible for making their number up. What I failed to realize during all those Christmases in the, the trenches or the pews is that Hopkins assigned a name to each of his three kings. You are literally supposed to sing the part for each character, which we never did in church, but that's what you're supposed to do. There is Gasp, uh, Gaspar, uh, excuse me, Gaspard brought the gold, 
Mil I guess it's Melchior or Melchior, the frankincense, and Balthazar, the myrrh. Where in the world would he get phone book listings such as those if he was simply assuming? I thought that's what he was doing. All those naughty people who turned around in church rather than singing the song as they were instructed to told me we must, mustn't assume there were three of them simply because three gifts were offered. That's not exactly how it went down, though. Hopkins didn't go out of his way in naming the actor parts unless he had an investigative lead. So here you see a lot of artwork, you know, going all through the three kings, three kings, three kings, just it's everywhere. And I could just, I could have added as usual pages of them. Perform an image search on the three wise men. Why don't you? Particular to my investigation was medieval artwork. All I'm seeing in every single one of them is three dudes, never four or five or 12. The only argument being had by the artist was whether or not they wore crowns or a Phrygian cap or a Phrygian cap. Here's more. Always three, three, three. There is another controversy to be had, which regards whether or not one of the kings or Pythagoreans was black or not. In every tale, he would be a Balth Balthazar. So in these ones here, you see the uh, the black. Uh, the other two are white. One's black. And he was the bringer of myrrh. There's your third main variant. Just to make sure we're on the same page, I... I <laughs> They showed you a lot of pictures too of people doing Christmas pageants uh, all over the world, and they there's always one guy who puts on blackface. Probably not the best idea to do that today, but they're trying to get the role down. How many magi do you see in any given image? I'm still counting three on my fingers, and every single one of them. Every artist and gentleman scholar in his story assumed the number of magi matched the gifts on the baby registry. Apparently. Given what we're told in Matthew 2, 1 through 2, none of this is adding up. So Melchior, along with the other Magi, is purported to be buried in the shrine of the three kings in Cologne Cathedral, following his remains being moved from Constantinople by Eustor Gius I in 314 AD to Milan. In 1164, this is, of course, official history, Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa moved them to Cologne. And the Melchior is commemorated on the Feast of Epiphany along with the other members of the Magi, but is also commemorated in Catholicism with his feast day of being the 6th of January. There is even a claim as to the final resting place of the three Magi. For those of you who have been following my Millennial Kingdom research, you'll never guess where. Well, now you can because I just read it to you. It's Cologne Cathedral. That's where the history writers tell us they were moved in 1164 by Emperor Barbarossa. But even before that, the remains were moved from Constantinople to Milan in 314 by Emperor Eustorgius. The suggestion there is that their bodies had already been gathered into one place, seeing as how they could be found in Constantinople. The shrine, which is said to contain them, can still be found in Cologne Cathedral to this day. And since I have already proposed the resurrection of the dead and the whereabouts of 500 AD, uh, actually, you know, it looked like 540s, 550-ish, maybe 530, I will let you make up your own mind as to whether those bones, if there are any, be theirs or somebody else's. A lot of times they're probably saying there's bones and, you know, there's empty tombs, things like that. They're, they're literally, I mean, there, there's catacombs, guys, where they say, they cleared them out for tourist purposes. Oh, sure. What if there were no bones in there to begin with? Or maybe just very few. Figuring that, figuring that out is not necessarily my directive at the moment. It's said to be the largest sarcophagus in the world, though that's a given, seeing as how it contains the reported remains of three men rather than the usual one. Sorry to sound like a broken record, but you think somebody, anybody other than the discontented Christmas carol singers in the row in front of me, would have taken umbrage with the number at any given point in his story. Well, then look at what else I just recently stumbled upon. This comes from, oh, this comes from the book, uh, Revelation of the Magi. I have this on my bookshelf. Interesting read. 
The names of the wise men and kings were called as follows. Zahar Wandad, son of Artaban. Hormids, son of Sanatruk. Ostazb, son of Gudafar. I'm already reading three at least. Arsak, son of Miruk. Zarwan, son of Wadwad. Ariho, son of Kosrau. Arta uh, Sisat, son of Howlat. Astan Bozan, son of Ciceron. Miruk, son of Human. <laughs> He's a son of a human. Asira, son of Saban. Nazar, Nazardi, son of Baladon, and Merodak, son of Bil. These are kings, sons of eastern kings, and land of Shur, which is the outer part of the entire east of the world, inhabited by human beings at the ocean, the great sea beyond the world, east of the land of Nod, that place in which dwelt Adam, head and chief of all the families of the world. So they're telling you that this wasn't Mesopotamia. These guys came from the east, the east, the farthest you can go east. You guys know my cosmology, hopefully by this point, if you've been following my videos. And that's, of course, the revelation of the Magi. What in the world? Somebody played with math and took the multiplication table out on the wise men because now I'm counting 12 of them in total. Not even their names match up. Revelation of the Magi, indeed. I've read this book from beginning to end, so I can tell you the conclusion has the Magi being baptized decades later by the Apostle Taom Thomas. It furthermore appears to be a very early, well-preserved Christian document, maybe even older than the 3rd century when the bone story was first documented in Constantinople. Even as theological themes line up with the Acts of Taom. So what gives? Maybe I'll read to you guys uh, the Acts of Thomas someday. A really interesting book. A very long book. There's something else you should probably know. Revelation of the Magi was only just recently, quote-unquote, discovered and translated. How very convenient. And I think I know what is happening. The number of wise men, albeit three or twelve, is probably not so dissimilar from what we've already seen going on with Samson and Delilah. I explained that earlier. And the hair cutter or the lion and the wolf and the lamb. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if Revelation of the Magi was a recognized authority in another reality. Meaning it's a document which has only recently blended with our own time and space and was therefore discovered, thereby muddying the waters. The same might even be stated regarding the Magi versus the kings. And then there is the black man component. So many parallels which may have emerged. And we're only now realizing them and thinking it's always been that way. One reality doesn't qualify, uh, I'm sorry, one reality doesn't disqualify the other as being untruthful. It's why I started out saying not to be too hard on those who claim to recall reading three wise men or three magi or three kings in their Bibles. There's a lot of people out there uh, saying that they remember, it said three wise men, it said three magi, they remember that. And of course, my reality in this case, uh, this is what most Mandela effects, I'm like, yeah, I'm affected by that. Now, this is one of those that I'm not affected by. But I looked into it and I you know, dug up some interesting stuff. For me, Matthew was always unconcerned with their number, but then that just goes to clue you into what universe my people derive from. Um, now, I'm not going to read you this Philip K. Dick uh, story again. This was the Millennial Kingdom already happened, Philip K. Dick, in the first Mandela effect. Uh, and again, I'm fascinated with this idea. I was shocked because I had heard the uh, I had heard many, many truthers talking about and seeing clips of Philip K. Dick talking about uh, the the matrix that we live in. There was this famous speech in the 1970s at a French uh, science fiction convention. And I finally sit down just looking for info, you know, just randomly like I'm going to sit down and, and, and uh, listen to his speech. And I was floored. And he said that the basis of all his novels, all his books, everything was this idea that the, millenn the millennial kingdom of Mashiach already physically happens or that it is simultaneously happening, one of the two, and that it is, uh, we are like dimensions removed from it. So in that way, you can almost see something like it never happened, but it did happen, right? And again, I am not pushing Christ consciousness. If that's what Philip K. Dick is doing, that's on him. It's not on me. 
I think it's fascinating nonetheless. Now he brings up some really uh, fascinating points. And, uh, you know, I point out here that Philip K. Dick, he comes across to me like an MK Ultra guy. Like, you know, he's got controllers, he's got, you know, uh, people showing up and at his doorstep and, and giving him, you know, little trigger words and things like that. Uh, I, I think he was probably kind of a sad guy. Uh, I think he was a victim, but uh, put out some brilliant fiction nonetheless. Uh, there's something I wanted to talk about here before going on. Oh, yeah. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, I talked about uh, Schrodinger's cat, all that. So let me just scan it down. He gets into deja vu and how deja vu is based on our former reality. So I, I did mention this in here. And there was a documentary that came out really recently in the last few years called Long Promise Road. And I only watched that about seven months, nine months ago. I, I lose track of time now. And it, I got really disturbed watching it because in the it's an actual documentary about this writer. He's a writer for Rolling Stone who went to meet Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys and, uh, and do an article on his life. And in doing so, he actually became very good friends with Brian Wilson. And they, for throughout the years, they kept meeting up and going on drives and, you know, going out to eat and that kind of stuff. They just became friends, like a, a relationship between a reporter and a musician. And the thing that really troubled me about this is that it, I, I had no knowledge of this. Um, I've always been a fan of the Beach Boys, but I had no knowledge of this. And these were serial dreams that I had already had. I had had these serial dreams where I was a, uh, it was like it just kept happening over so many years, and it would tune in to uh, me being a reporter going and meeting Brian Wilson, and that Brian Wilson became a very dear friend of mine. And I didn't really know what to make of it until I saw this movie. And then I, you know, getting into all this kind of research, and I, I speculated is it possible that these dreams that we have are actually glances into? other parallel realities that you know these different lives that we live now i'll tell you that in i won't get into the other serial dreams i have some of them can get very intimate but uh there's about three can, uh, I, I have not had this dream again since seeing this documentary it killed it it was over it's done i don't i don't know if i'll ever dream that again but i have about three or four different serial dreams that i've had over the last 20 years or so i mean they've been developing and in all these dreams, uh, I it's like I see myself in a different reality, and I feel the emotion and the, the storyline, what's happening, and just think, you know, I, I keep looking into it, and I can tell you guys, in every single one of these um, dreams, the reality that I live now is the best one. Uh, the, the The reality that I live now is the one that I am seeking the truth. I am seeking Yahuwah. I want to be in this covenant. I want to be set apart, and you know, I. I read and I teach his uh, scripture. For me, that this is the best world that I live in. And all the others, it's it's kind of vain and uh, being run by, you know, it's just spirit, you know, spiritual terrors and just all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but I want to point that out. Really interesting. Maybe some of you guys can think about if you guys have serial dreams like that. And you know, are they are our dreams glances into? other worlds. Uh, I talked about that with visions, right? When we looked at the visions in, in Bible, how they go outside of time. And here I, I transcribe his speech again. You can read that video. You could read that paper for yourself. You could look at the video. I'm not going to repeat all that tonight. I wanted to close on this note. The 7,000 year timeline deception in light of the Mandela effect. Now, again, I want to point out that I have based a lot of my ideas on the millennial kingdom happening based on the LXX timeline, which is a divergent from the Masoretic. The Masoretic, it shows that Yahushua HaMashiach arrived and was resurrected in the year 4,000, which would lead us, you know, into the year about, you know, 6,000 now, right? Uh, but according to the LXX, he came in the year 5,500. And according to this text, I'm not going to go through them all again, it shows that he, um, uh, the millennial kingdom came in in the year 6,000, 500 years later, all right? Now, this world is a very strange place to inhabit, in case you haven't noticed already, and I happen to like it that way. 
The Lion and the Lamb is a book I published recently, and as you may have already guessed, it focuses upon the phenomenon known as the Mandela Effect. Some of you may be surprised to learn that I don't think the Wolf and the Lamb passage in Isaiah 11, 6 is necessarily wrong. Oh, sure, the lion laying with the lamb is vital to my own past experiences and memories. There is plenty of residue to back up our collective memories as well. I'm sorry if some of this is repetitive, but I, I find that repetition is, is, is key. And of course, these are different articles I'm reading. There is, there is plenty of residue to back up our collected memories as well. That is to say, the wolf and the lamb never existed in my own reality until maybe a decade ago. It probably took me several years of processing these changes back with some deep dives into rarely read texts, many of which uh, have recently come to light, you know, wink, wink, to really begin and appreciate what appears to be going on. Now, again, be repeating this again with uh, Samson. They're both correct to the respective parallel realm. Just because Yeshiahu, that would be Isaiah, wrote lion in one reality and wolf in another doesn't mean we have to choose an incorrect proposition. There's actually numerous other biblical examples that I could give. Perhaps the best that I can give of at the moment is Delilah sitting in a barber to cut Samson's hair rather than doing the deed herself, as many of us remember. And I, in that paper, I showed there's a lot of artwork out there where it shows Delilah cutting the hair. But then you have all this other artwork, which I don't ever remember seeing, where the barber is cutting the hair. And one of them, to my um, to my grief, was the children's Bible. You guys all know what I'm talking about. It's like the comp, like the comic book of goes through the whole Bible. And I looked in there, and it's the barber cutting the hair. I'm like, no, because I had, I still have the children's Bible, like in my, you know, and I I never remember the barber cutting the hair. So uh, perhaps, okay, the, the, perhaps the best that I can think of at the moment is Delilah sitting in a barber to cut Samson's hair rather than doing the deed herself, as many of us remember. Subtle changes such as that one is precisely how multiverse theory works. In any given day, there are hundreds of decisions which we are tasked with making. These decisions branch off into alternate realities in such a way that the parallels closest to us are subtle in their changes, whereas we might expect to see the most drastic changes the further out we go, you know, the, the further out in the, the world, like puddle hopping we go. I can very much see a reality where Delilah cut his hair and another where her conscience got the better of her and she couldn't do the deed herself. In both cases, the outcome was still the same. Samson's hair was cut and his eyes were gouged out. I hope you guys appreciate how I'm spilling Samson with a P as well, because that's another Mandela effect. The only thing I don't like about discussions surrounding the Mandela effect is that it's been advertised as a new phenomenon when, in fact, I believe manipulation of our construct, the, the subtle blending of parallel realities, has been going on for who knows how many generations at this point. That's where my thoughts have been going with the biblical timeline debate. And again, these are just thoughts. These are just things I'm speculating on. I'm not telling you what I'm about to say is I'm not saying this is the way it is, right? I hope you guys can appreciate that. I'm just throwing this out there. What if this is a possibility? If you need a refresher, the modern Hebrew Old Testament, which constitutes the bulk of our Bibles, is, is referred to as the Masoretic text, whereas we also have the Greek LXX to contend with. Compare their genealogical timelines. Why don't you? The LXX has Adam's placement in the garden in 5451 BC, whereas NT has him making an appearance in 4065. That's nearly a 1500 year difference. The same timelines have Yehusha HaMashiach being born in the whereabouts of 4,000 years after Adam's placement in the garden, according to the Masoretic, or 5,500 if we're going with the LXX. I'm sounding like a broken record at this point. Supposing the Masoretic timeline is true, then Abraham was born in the year 1948, after Adam's placement, that is. This has been pointed out repeatedly as the modern nation of Israel was established in 1948. And what are the odds? According to the same timeline, Shem outlived Abraham and also would have known Yitzhak and Yaakov. Shem would have known 11 generations of his descendants in total, but not so with the LXX. Shem may have been a contemporary of Nimrod, but they would have both been long gone before Abraham was born, according to the LXX timeline. And so you're so unless you're 66 canon only, there is your attention. Because we have many extra biblical books which advocate both timelines. Yashur and the writings of Abraham unapo unapologetically side with the Masoretic, pitting Abraham in co direct conflict with Nimrod whenever possible. And introducing Shem as Melchizedek, 
uh, whereas a host of others like Adam and Eve and Bezora and Nicodemus, that'd be the gospel of Nicodemus, pointedly line up with the LXX timeline, invoking Yahushua's thousand Uranus 6,000, 500 years after his initial arrival. Which of the two timelines are right or wrong, and how do we decide which mile marker we've arrived upon? One well-noted observation is that the Jews began tampering with their own Torah after they rejected Yahushua as their, as their Mashiach. Changing the timeline played a vital role in their own delusions, showing why the LXX was based upon a credible Hebrew translation, which was later scrubbed, is another discussion entirely, though. I'm not interested in having that one today. Though really, the Mandela effect, with its various interwoven dimensions at play, is a tampering of reality, is it not? Would it surprise you to learn that both Yashar as well as the writings of Abraham are recent short season discoveries? That is ample enough proof for many of you that they are fakes or forgeries intended to confuse our roadside mile markers, which very well may be true. I don't know. And that we need to, and what we need to do is huddle, um, uh, huddle the books we are familiar with in Roman approved canon or huddle with. But to that point, I disagree. I had stated, I had started out saying this world is a strange place to be and that I like it that way. Living within the tension of perceived contradictions as well as unanswered questions is something which I've also grown accustomed to. Now, I'm, I'm not proposing any answers for you today. My aim is to invoke the mere possibility that we're looking at two separate interwoven timelines of parallel realities. Yes, that's what I'm suggesting as a possibility. I mean, the, the, it's just, it's one of those things when you start going down the Manila effect, you start looking at it just practically and, and applying it. You're like, that's totally possible. It's almost as though our feet are straddling both of them, if you can buy that, and everyone is taking sides. C.S. Lewis already spoke about the various measurements of time within his Chronicles of Narnia series, which I covered in part of my Narnia recent paper. I actually wrote this part. If you guys remember the Narnia recent paper, uh, I wrote uh, I, I wrote this like in the same week as that. Do you recall how the four Pevensey children left Narnia for England, resided there for the short span of a year, only to return and learn that thousands of years had passed in Narnia? What if we have been given a glance into something like that? The equivalent would be two parallel events, except that one extended 1,500 years beyond the other. Everybody loves to read about these, sort, uh, these sorts of mind-bending realizations if they're cataloged in the safe space of the library, the fiction section, but then lose their cool the moment someone suggests it's a theoretical possibility. Then the name, then the name calling starts. Do they think Lewis was just sitting around with his contemporary Oxford intellectuals making this stuff up? Wait, don't answer that. Our perception of reality within the construct is a very fragile thing. Do understand I'm not supporting in any way, shape, or form the sin of the scribes or tampering of the said matrix in any way, shape, or form if it is indeed our controllers playing the part of the demurish, corrupting everything. And that's obviously what's happening, right? So if from the top level management, Satan is doing this, I'm not saying that's okay, right? This is like Nephilim behavior we're seeing, right? We're seeing a corruption of everything. I'm just saying that the the, the different timelines needn't be fiction, right? They, they could be re real realities. I think it will do us well, though, to try to the best of our ability and comprehend, if not appreciate, what may very well be going on. As I stated earlier, I believe this tampering has been going on for a great deal longer than most of us uh, have allotted for. And what I see are two distinct timelines, but then possibilities aside, getting people to see the textual corruption is difficult enough. I think that was all I was gonna share tonight. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And, um, So I'm just looking here to if anyone has any questions or anything like that. All right. Um, it looks like there was a <laughs> maybe something heated that happened. I don't really know. Um, anyways, all right. So, um, yeah, guys, that's it for tonight. 
uh, shalom, Shabbat shalom. Hope you guys enjoy your weekend, your Sabbath, get a lot of rest. And uh, love you guys to do this again next week. I'll have uh, more tour portions next Friday, as well as some other, uh, you know, scripturally backed, uh, theological, doctrinal, uh, truther, what if, conspiratorial, something for you guys. And good night, everybody.